can be recorded. If you have any questions, Scott is a wealth of knowledge in fishing. So if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A section. If you don't see that, it's probably down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Pop that open, put your questions in there. There's a couple links that we'll reference during the talk and I'll put those in the chat area. So if you wanna click on those, open the chat and click on those. I think with that, Scott, um, you know, we call it the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. And we always get lots of questions on this. And one of the stewardship things I wanted to point out with ice fishing for sure is it always comes up every year. We see a lot of social media posts on it, but it's all the stuff that people leave out there in the ice. So please, if you're out there fishing, it's a great thing to do in the winter. It's a great time to spend some family time, catch some fish, but please make sure you're bringing everything home with you. So, and especially some smiles with your kids like that. I love that picture. So, and with that, I'd like to introduce Scott McIntoon. He's our area fishery supervisor out in Hutchinson area. Uh, like I said, he's a wealth of knowledge in fishing. He's a great outdoor writer, does some photography, and uh, does does a lot of fishing and outdoor activities with, you know, a whole bunch of people, including his family. So, welcome, Scott. Right. Thanks a lot, Benji. Yeah, it's good to have folks with today. This afternoon, we're going to talk about one of my favorite things to do uh, in the wintertime, ice angling for panfish. So we're kind of gearing this to a wide ranging audience. We've got a lot to cover today. So I want to be moving kind of briskly through this, uh, but also having some time for questions at the end. So thank you for joining and thank you, Benji, for the stewardship message. That is a good one. Try to pick up after yourselves on the ice. Uh, certainly this time of year, the snow blows around, it covers up things. If you don't pick them up immediately, or you're out on the ice and you forget about it, uh, that stuff doesn't just go away. It ends up, uh, it ends up in the lake, it ends up blowing up on shore, it ends up being a problem. So that's probably the single uh, most important thing that we can do as a community of ice anglers is picking up after ourselves. So today I'm gonna to go through a few different topics. Uh, we're gonna talk about why fish for panfish. We're gonna go through some gear, basic, covering everything that you need. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about techniques, and we are going to uh, talk about resources that are available for you uh, from the Department of Natural Resources and elsewhere. So why panfish? Well, the big answer there is, this is just a ubiquitous uh, grouping of fish. It's the most widely uh, distribute, distributed grouping of fish in the state. Uh, they're found in every county. We have over 2,000 lakes in Minnesota that have sunfish, crappie, or perch. Uh, most, it is the most harvested, harvested uh, fish in the state and the second most popular. Um, that's coming from our creel information. Basically, uh, DNR has folks that are out there interviewing folks about how their uh, fishing is going, how long they've been fishing, what they've caught, what they've they, what they have released. And actually, I think our uh, the popularity of panfish would probably increase even more if so many of our creels weren't focused on the 10 largest walleye lakes in the state. Uh, it's a bread and butter species. Um, and it's for that reason, it's kind of a challenge to manage because people have differing attitudes towards them. Uh, many folks recognize their food value. Some want the opportunity to catch large fish. It's kind of a, an every man's or woman's fish. And just for simplicity's sake, uh, the definition of panfish, it's a, a lot of folks can argue over what it really means, but very simple, fits in a pan. Uh, usually small fish that can be caught on light tackle. Uh, for today's talk, we're gonna focus on sunfish, crappie, and perch, but you could extend it to white and yellow bass, yellow bass like the one in that photo right there, uh, bottom photo. Um, but so there's really not an exact definition, but I think it's well understood for uh, a handful of species that fit in a pan and can be caught on light tackle. So let's go into some gear details. And what I'm going to do is I'm arranging this so that folks can take a look at options. If you're brand new to ice fishing and you're on a very tight budget, we're going to talk about what your options might be. And then we can talk about uh, all the way down the line, uh, getting to more expensive uh, or, or more higher end options. So First off, you have to be able to cut a hole in the ice. There's no getting around it. Every one of us, if you're an avid angler, you forget something every once in a while because there's a lot of gear you have to bring. I am guilty. I have forgotten the auger before. Uh, luckily, I haven't driven too terribly far to forget the auger. Just trips around home, but it does happen. Then you got to turn around and go get it. Um, you can't just uh, kick through the ice or 
or put your hand down and melt it. It would take a long time. But uh, I would start by with all this gear. If you're if you're trying to get into break into ice angling, you've never done it. Uh, definitely go and check out the used market. And I'll touch on that here with augers. Um, gas is quickly being replaced. It has been for five to 10 years now by electric lithium batteries. The same batteries that are operating cars and smartphones are being adapted and used for icing, ice augers and working very well. Even in the coldest, coldest days, they're they're working very well. And, and it, it really, there was a lot of concerns over if it would work or not. And they are working. You do have to do maintenance with augers. You want to replace uh, dull blades. You can go with the chipper versus the shaper. You get the curve style blades. Um, you know, you have to be able to charge an electric battery if you're somewhere. And if, if you're somewhere remote, you um, you may not have that option. I think it's worth pointing out, you do need to uh, give hand augers a consideration. So over on the left-hand side, uh, the, cheap, the cheapest option out there are hand augers. Uh, very inexpensive. If you go into the Boundary Waters canoe area, you're required to use a hand auger. You can't use anything motorized. Uh, so starting off with a hand auger is a good way to go. I mentioned the used market um, because electric has gotten so popular. There's a lot of gas models on the used market. And then if you really want to go to the high end, you can go with the electric. After that, you have to have kind of some, you have to have outerwear basically. Um, and this is what I'd say. We're Minnesotans. Most of the folks tuning in today, you're cold hardy folks. You know what winters are like here. You probably already have a winter coat, hat, gloves, all the prerequisites that you need for ice fishing. Go ahead and use that equipment. Uh, that picture on the bottom left there uh, is from the old college years, you know, back 20 years ago with uh, an uninsulated house that's sweating and just my plain old, you know, whatever I threw on. But, you know, those were some very fond times of getting out and cutting my teeth on being a very avid ice angler. And then since that time, um, I do have dedicated uh, suits, parkin bibs that are explicitly used for ice fishing that carry all my equipment, almost like a fly fisherman's vest and really nice houses, uh, a number of houses that I use for different applications. So you can get to that level of specialization. And then on the, on the right-hand side, a friend of mine, Travis, picture of his kids inside their permanent fish house. They make fishing a family activity that everyone goes out in a permanent fish house. It is a, a dedicated thing, right? You're really committing long-term if you're gonna spend that kind of money. And with the permanent fish houses, a lot of them are produced in Minnesota. Uh, you can get out and camp with those. You can get a lot of utility uh, from those. So uh, even beyond the ice fishing season. Uh, really, the, the houses have come a long way. The portables, uh, they're insulated. They really keep the heat in, which leads into the next thing. If you do get a portable fish house, you will need some sort of heater for it. On the left-hand side, a basic catalytic heater, your mid-level model, like a big buddy. Um, then kind of the more expensive one is a newer version here that was released last year. This is a buddy flex. Uh, there's other companies that make heaters, but by and large, the market share is covered by Mr. Heater. You just have to be careful with these things. Um, where you're putting them, so you're not gonna melt anything. You have to heat it according to the amount of fishable space that you have. Um, again, the insulated shacks these days really do a great job with heat retention. Uh, on many days, I'm really not running any heat at all or just running it on low. But for those really cold and windy days, you want to do a good job of banking snow around your house when that's possible. Um, I'm coming to you from southern Minnesota. We have about three inches of ice on the ground, excuse me, of snow on the ground. And uh, it's pretty hard to bank houses when there's so little of it available on the lakes where it blows around. The next thing I'll touch on are fish finding electronics. There's quite a bit of width uh, and breadth to the variety of fish finding electronics that are available uh, for anglers. And this is a bit of a deviation from probably past DNR guidance on ice fishing. I can remember teaching ice fishing clinics uh, in the Waterville area when I was at that station. And we focused on, uh, we never really talked about electronics, but as someone that uh, is a very avid angler, I would make the argument that if you already have a lot of outerwear, you can skip buying the house. If you already have a small inexpensive auger, the next thing I would splurge on is to try to find some sort of fish finding electronics. Again, you can find used options. Uh, the one on the left is a basic LCD handheld like a television remote model, probably uh, $100, maybe even less than that these days. 
the middle one is is a Vexilar, a Minnesota company that's pretty popular. They they have anywhere from real expensive ones with all the bells and whistles to a basic model. All of these are going to help you catch fish. I'll elaborate on that in a little bit. And then on the right hand side, we've got probably the Cadillac version for modern fish finders technology that's been uh, out for only a handful of years, a Garmin Panoptic side scanning sonar unit. So not just down viewing like these other uh, transducer setups. Uh, this is something that shoots out to the side so you can really speed up your uh, options for finding fish. You'll also notice I do not have uh, underwater cameras in on here. Uh, you can use underwater cameras. Uh, they're a great tool, I would say. Um, they're particularly useful for identifying structure, what you're seeing or what you're on top of, seeing if there's vegetation down there. Um, you, you, you have some options. I think they're more of a scouting tool than a, a fishing tool, just because once you put an underwater camera and cable down, it's kind of like putting an anchor down. Uh, you're staying in that spot. And uh, some fish actually do get spooked by the by the camera, you know, the, the the cable going down and the and the actual lens versus these transducers are just below the ice shooting sound waves down uh, a form of sonar. So and if you don't elect to go this route, you you, you don't want to spend the money. That's an, op an option, too. You can buy just a simple depth bomb. It is a small clip on weight. You can put it on your uh, hook, drop it to the bottom and figure out where the bottom is. Mark it. Maybe take a, a a a marker and mark your line, or or if you're uh, setting a bobber, you can set the bobber at that depth. Um, but the the thing with all these electronics is with panfish, you need to find active fish. It's not typically a sit and wait game unless it's a known location that fish are going to come around at a certain time. Uh, so that's one thing I can't emphasize enough. I've talked to a lot of, you know, parents that don't fish, that their their kids are really interested. And I say, you know, Christmas time comes and they want to get something for the kid. And they're looking for recommendations. Boy, if you can find a used flasher or something, um, we're out there to have fun and, and catching fish is part of that equation. It's not the sole and only motivation for going out and ice fishing, but it certainly uh, makes it more exciting for kids and for parents and for families. So this is something that, uh, you know, even within fisheries management, uh, there's angler surveys and creels that we've found that folks that use electronics are just plain more successful. So if you want to be successful on the ice, it's worth checking out finding uh, some fish finding electronics in one form or another. Uh, really can't say enough about it. Uh, Swipping into other gear, uh, it's really remarkable what 30 years has done for ice fishing rods and combos. Uh, the market's really exploded. You kind of, uh, and it's not always you get what you pay for. You can spend lots and lots of money. You can get customized rods with, uh, you know, the fancy grips and whatever colors you want and to whatever length you want and action and how fast your tip is and really species specific applications. You can do all those things, um, but these days, unlike in the past 30, you know, beyond 30 or 40 years ago, you can really buy an off the shelf model that's going to help you catch fish. So on the left, I've got a picture of some HT blues. It's about a five to $15 rod. If I jam them in the door, if I break them, I'm not too concerned because I didn't spend an arm and a leg, but they still help me catch a lot of fish. Um, and then you can buy a combo for 30, $40 that has the reel already attached. So there are options out there with rods for just about anything. And obviously when we're talking panfish, we're usually talking uh, ultralight, light, maybe medium light at most action. It sort of depends. Um, pan sunfish in particular, lighter gear typically is used. While a perch rod, you may go with a more medium to medium light uh, if you're getting after some really big perch and fishing bigger lures. And the same can be said about uh, reels. Uh, they've come a long way. We have a few different options. I'm just going to touch on these. There's these schoolie reels you see on the left. You can buy those for 5 or $10. Um, spinning reels kind of in the middle, they've come a long way. I, I can remember I still have spinning reels that the instant anti-reverse is set um, about halfway back. Now almost everything you buy brand new has an automatic instant uh, anti-reverse. The drags are very smooth. Even for the inexpensive models, it's really impressive what the spinning reels do. One thing I want to touch on real quickly when it comes to panfish fishing, and we make this breakout between spinning reels and straight line reels. The schoolie reel on the left is a straight line sort of option. Fly reels have been used as a straight line option. And you're seeing a lot of these free fall dropping options that have a clutch 
and um, they're actually geared up. So this is a one-to-one -one gear ratio. A spinning reel is something like four to one. So every time you turn the crank, you're picking up a lot of line on a spinning reel. But when you're doing that, it's going over this line roller. This line roller is introducing twist into your line. Now for perch and for crappies, the twist probably isn't a big deal. But if you are a bluegill aficionado, they will sit and inspect your bait for minutes on end. And if it's down there doing revolutions in front of them, they are not going to bite on it. So you have seen a lot of folks that have turned to straight line reel options. And again, if you want to spend the money, you can go to more expensive offerings like these free fall systems where you do have the beefed up uh, line pickup, you do have a really smooth drag, and you do have that clutch that allows you to free fall and drop it very rapidly. Most of the straight line um, Reel combos, I'm reels. I'm recommending folks not fish those below about 20 feet of water, just because um, if you don't have it geared up or you're using very light jigs, it takes a long time to get down there and a long time to reel up, particularly if you're on a, a one to one retrieving combo. All right, we'll keep going here. Line is the next uh, prerequisite. You have to have line, obviously. Um, a few things. There, I have these broken down by price category. The monofilament's usually the cheapest, fluorocarbon's kind of middling, and braid is more expensive. But really, it's all what your preference is. If you're already an angler, you probably know a little bit about some of these lines. Mono is, is very forgiving and stretches. Fluorocarbon has a property where when it goes in the water, light passes through it, and it is very hard for fish to see. And braid is highly sensitive. There's no stretch in it. If you feel something messing with the bait, it's usually a fish and you get that that sensitivity and that that bite detection. Um, you know, it's kind of trying to fit what the application is that you're using. I run a lot of monofilament. Um, you could run fluorocarbon if you're running places that are very clear and you have line shy fish. Typically with some of these panfish, they're not too fussy. Um, they can see the line and they'll still bite on it, which is one of the reasons you see this monofilament is yellow. Uh, colored lines and metered lines are very popular. Metered lines are alternating between a color and a uh, and, and clear and colored lines. So when you're fishing with these lines, you're looking down and you're seeing uh, your line twitch and move as you jig it and you can detect small movements. You can actually watch the line. So you kind of have this line watching, uh, tight lining it sometimes gets called, and high visibility line is actually preferred by some of those anglers. Very popular on panfish ice fishing tournaments. So you do have a lot of line options out there. Um, I, I'll even throw in uh, a spool of fly line, six or seven X tippet, just to have something really, really small. Uh, you do have a lot of options with line. Uh, on to lures and jigs, and this could be an unending conversation. Um, if you really want to go go inexpensively, just go raid your summer box. There's going to be a lot of things you can move over. You can do the same thing with your with your spinning reels. You can take them off your uh, summer combinations, put them on your ice fishing rods, and you know you're gonna you're gonna have shorter rods, obviously, than open water because you're sitting over the hole. But you, you can move a lot of those things over from your summer collection. The same is true of lures and jigs. So if you have a bunch of flu flus from the summer, bring them over, use them in the winter time. Um, one distinction I'll make: it, you've seen a lot of of use of tungsten uh, relatively recently as tungsten's become more readily available and plants overseas are are fusing them and, and putting them together. It has a little different uh, physical properties than traditional lead higher melting point, more dense. So typically for the same profile, um, they'll be quite a bit heavier for the same profile compared to lead. So they fish a little bit heavier. And sometimes you want something that drops like a stone. Sometimes you want something that falls down slowly. So you do have times and places for both lead and for tungsten. So take a look at those. I will tell you the lead is going to be a lot cheaper option for what you're purchasing. One of the things that's noteworthy, uh, we talked about electronic use. You want to have these jigs uh, give you a good bounce back on your sonar if you're fishing with a flasher. So you'll notice I've got a whole bunch of uh, tungsten jigs on the right-hand side there. Many of them have just the right profile and they're dense enough that they're sending a, a good return. So when I'm looking at my flasher and it's representing the water column on the dial, I can see the bottom, I can figure out the depth and I can see my jig going down. Uh, and that's the beauty really of using those flashers and just getting that bounce back off of those jigs. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't other um, options out there. Certainly, um, you know, it's it. a lot of it is organized by 
mouth size and what the primary diet is. Bluegills are mainly insectivores, very small mouths. Um, that picture is of a, a hybrid green sunfish and pumpkin seed cross. It has a really large mouth for a sunfish, but typically they have small mouths. They're feeding on insects. We'll use a lot of small jigs. Now, when we're talking about perch and we're talking about crappies, those are primarily piscivorous fish. They are looking to switch over at some point in their life history to eating minnows. And we will be able to throw small hard baits at them. We'll be able to throw larger jigs. We'll be able to put spoons uh, and use those. So you can fish a little more aggressive with those piscivorous fish. Um, and just a quick uh, a note here, I didn't really touch on bait, but you do have a lot of options with what you put on these lures and jigs. You can use small pieces of plastic, but by and large, the, the most popular baits that are used in winter are uh, spikes or maggots, also called Euro larva, and we've got waxworms, and waxworms have had some popularity in the summer as well. Um, both of these, you're threading them on the hook. Waxworms, you're threading on the hook. The the wigglers are a little a little tougher skin. They're actually a fly larva. A lot of times, you're just piercing through the end and leaving the hook exposed. But you, even though those are terrestrial insects, we're mimicking aquatic insects. They smell and taste like other insect life, so they're pretty irresistible to many panfish species. All right, we will get into a bit on technique. So when we are jigging, uh, you're gonna use short kind of kicking or pounding uh, motions just to really make it sit there and move uh, intently in the water. Get the attention of these fish. They're usually sight feeding fish. They can see you from a distance as you drop down. Um, other things to keep in mind, don't be too aggressive with your jigging. Panfish typically don't want quick jerking movements. If all of a sudden they come in to inspect it and you're pulling it away rapidly, they're likely to spook and get out of there. That's a universal, you know, danger is near signal if something jets off very rapidly and they're going to do the same thing. You want to just move it uh, very slowly, subtly. There are times and, and you can kind of see the reaction that you're getting from the fish to really gauge how you want to jig for them. You want to maintain contact on the fall. So we have this idea that, well, we're going to open up our bale or put on free spool and we're going to drop our lure to the very bottom of, of the lake. Uh, if we do that and we do it willy nilly without paying attention, we can be missing fish. There's a number of fish that are going to swim over and grab it when it's on the fall because they think something is injured or dying or dead and it's a free meal. So maintain contact. Don't have slack in your line when you are jigging. Make sure you're pounding the bottom. This is a great little tip. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in a soft substrate, if you're in a harder substrate. Um, there's a lot of aqu a lot of aquatic insect life that's down there that you can really take advantage of. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit here, but um, you know there are that's a great way to get their attention. You'll put up a little sediment plume and you can draw fish in. So make sure you're pounding the bottom. Once you're engaged with fish, you know they're down there, they're biting, you can feel them, or you're seeing them on your flasher electronics. You have to use some trial and error. Do, how do they want the bait to be presented? Do they want it to stay still? Do they want it moving slightly? And then how do they react when you take it away? That's really one of the things with all of these uh, panfish species is typically you want to just always keep it out of their grasp. You know, it's like putting the carrot on a, on a stick in front of the horse. You want to just take it away and make a move for it a little bit, fire them up. Uh, see if they'll chase it down. So pay attention to those reactions. They're giving you clues for how, what they like and don't like. All right, so finding the food. That's really what it comes down for, to for panfish. They have to have food. They, we're, we, you know, in Minnesota, well, anywhere, we're talking about fish. They're a cold-blooded organism. They have to, you know, have enough food intake to run their metabolism in the winter. It's a non-growing season. The water is cold. Uh, they still need to feed. They don't stop feeding. They're always uh, feeding. It certainly isn't as heavy as when their metabolism is much higher during the growing season in the summertime, but they still have those metabolic requirements. So there's two main patterns when it comes to panfish that are pretty common. It's not to say that there aren't other patterns, but two of the main patterns are a basin bite versus a vegetation bite. What I mean by that is if we're on a lake, you may see uh, you know, a really bowl shape to the lake with a sticky bottom. That's typically a basin bite. Fish are out on the flats. We're going to talk about what that means in just a second. But 
uh, they're moving around on that basin. Other times, our panfish are found in the weeds. They're all fish. They're going to spend time around aquatic vegetation as cover from predators as well as a place to find their food. So basin bite and vegetation bite, two great places to start your search as you're hunting to find fish. Find that food. Um, you know, pay attention to the substrates. They, if they're sandy or sticky bottom or muddy flats, uh, it's really filled with insect life. It could be a lot of chironomids down there, the so-called bloodworms. You could have ghost midges or chaebarus that are down there. You might have mayfly or stonefly larva. Um, zooplankton are hanging out in the day down close to the bottom because they know sight predators are going to gobble them up. If they rise off the bottom, they wait till it gets dark and you have this daily migration. If you're looking at your flasher when the sun's starting to go down, you see this clutter kind of rise up. That is zooplankton raising off the bottom. Um, they're hiding from these sight feeding panfish. And then even you'll have young crayfish that are a, a prey item for perch, for example. If young crayfish are going through a molt in the winter, uh, those fish might be down there feeding on those. So pay attention to what you're seeing with the food. Have a plan of where you're going to start or the places that you're going to try. So you're heading out to the lake, you need to do your homework on the front side before you hit the lake. Most people show up, they don't have a plan, or they just go where everyone else is. They see lots of houses set up. They think, those people must be catching fish. Let's go there. Typically, it's quite the opposite. We're just kind of a, a herding mentality that happens among a bunch of anglers, and it's really in your best interest to spread out because panfish especially don't like noise and commotion. Try to get away from those groups. Um, have a plan on where you're going to go, and we'll talk about making that plan in just a second. Uh, know this you need to move around you need to explore things uh, explore these spots cutting a hole is like making a cast you wouldn't go to the lake in your boat and make a single cast you would make many casts it's going to help you catch more fish ice fishing is the same way it's work you can't just leave your gear in the boat hook up and go you have to load and unload gear you've got to charge electronics you've got to tend to that gear and on the water each hole is like a cast some days you find the fish right away. Other day, days, you're going to cut lots of holes before you find the fish. So keep moving. Don't just sit down until you know there are fish around. How about big moves versus small moves? I think this is important for panfish anglers. If you're not marking anything at all, or you've tried a bunch of similar spots, uh, it's probably time for a big move. If you haven't looked around much, it's time for small moves. Uh, you could fish a flat and see nothing in the middle, uh, but there might be lots of fish around the edges, so you make that small move. Uh, it takes some time to learn when to make big moves versus small moves. And I think a good way to conceptualize this, I didn't come up with it. Um, one of our good fishing, uh, ice fishing anglers and, and kind of the, the go-to person in our state, Dave Gens, came up with this, the idea of tennis courts versus football fields. You make small moves on tennis courts, you know, small area that you're going to move across to search for fish, or you're going to make big moves to get the heck out of there and move away football fields size moves uh, just to get to a completely new spot. So uh, make sure you're moving around and trying to find those fish. Then there's a question, do I stay or do I go? Don't leave fish to find fish unless they are really small fish that don't interest you or they won't bite. Sometimes you can sit there. Maybe I'll be the first person to admit this. Maybe no one else will, but if I'm going to sit there and they're not going to bite and they're not going to bite and they're not going to bite and I've tried changing things up, it might just be time to move. Find some fish that are a lot more willing. Uh, find those positive fish that are willing to bite instead of those negative fish that keep ignoring you. And ultimately, this is about putting the pattern together. The journey is the fun part. It's not always the destination. We love catching fish, but sometimes you get a lot of enjoyment and utility out of the challenge of going out and finding these fish. Like so many things outdoors, it's about building the skills. So put that pattern together, figure out where those fish are, why they're there. All right, we're going to actually spend some time here breaking down uh, where you might start on some of these lakes, since this is a popular question when you do ice fishing kind of seminars. I'm going to run through a few different structural features on lakes. Uh, just so everyone understands, I am looking at uh, a picture here that's the Navionics web uh, app. This is free for folks that go on your home computer and pull this up. Benji can share the link. Uh, this is a great spot to bookmark and use it as a scouting tool. Uh, you know, if you're out on the water with your smartphone, there is a fee, uh, a subscription fee, an annual fee to use this on your smartphone, but it's it's really 
a good investment for being able to search out where you should start fishing. Uh, we do, I also will show you that the DNR has those resources available for free, but maybe to the not to the same level of detail as you might see here. But these are flats, they're open basins with similar flat depths. So you can see we've got one up here, 18, 17 feet. This isn't so much of a flat as it's a, you know gently sloping, dropping from four to 10. Uh, it's also worth noting there's a nice uh, island over here, so a different structural feature. And then we've got an 11 to 12 foot deep flat over here. These contours are explaining what the depth is around the lake. It's kind of like uh, taking a, a, a woodworking set and chipping away and, and setting your, your different depths. So that's how you, you have to spend some time learning how to interpret these maps. Another uh, place to try to find some panfish points, right? These are shoreline irregularities that distinctly point out. I mean, it's pretty obvious. This is a real obvious point right here. Um, but they can also exist underwater. And in those cases, they're typically called points or sometimes they're called fingers. Another interesting element of this particular point is we also have a second sort of structural uh, thing here, I guess. We have what's called a neck down. Um, they have the point right here and we have another shoreline. So if you want to travel between these two basins, they have to swim through this shallow area. So this is a great place to set up and intercept fish that may be moving from one part of the lake to the other. Uh, humps, you know, probably pretty uh, obvious one for folks. If you're out on a deep water lake, you see a hump that uh, rises up. It's an underwater protrusion that doesn't breach the surface. Otherwise we call it an island. Sometimes they get called sunken islands. Um, if you're looking at, if you don't have a, a bathymetric contour map, you can look at aerial photos sometimes. And if the water is clear enough, uh, you can make them out on aerial photos where you see um, a shallow area that sticks up or a reef. Uh, sometimes these humps will be called reefs, but these are great places. They're typically uh, places that uh, are a structural element to attract fish in and sometimes will hold their, their prey as well. Holes. You know, we've got a lot of shallow water that's adjacent to a deep hole, and it's not a great place always for all species of panfish. But a lot of times you can have crappies that will suspend over deep holes and on occasion sunfish. Uh, many times these are popular spots for folks to park uh, their permanent fish houses and sit over a hole because at one point or another there's probably going to be some fish that suspend there. And this is one that you won't find on any bathymetric map, but it's always worth looking for, which is submerged aquatic vegetation. We talked about many times with, the, with panfish, we're looking for vegetation or a vegetation bite. This requires a little bit of work. You need to have some familiarity with the lake. Where, uh, does, where does the vegetation grow? What species are there? Um, how deep is the photic zone? That's a, a limnological term for how far sunlight penetration, penetration reaches. Do we have plant growth to three feet? Five feet, six feet, eight feet? How deep does it go? What is that photic zone? Uh, how much clarity do we have in the water? Do the plants lay down and break down? Do they senesce or do we still have some that are still standing? There's basically a, a real simple way to break down your plants. You prefer, they, you want them to be standing naturally. Then, you know, sometimes they'll be brown and dead. And then the top cream of the crop is if we find standing green vegetation, green that is still alive, photosynthesizing, um, probably has is covered in insect life. So that's kind of something to key in on is, is finding that. It could be coontail, it could be milfoil, cabbage or pond weeds, could be muskgrass that carpets the bottom of the lake. There's a lot of different vegetation that is quite attractive to panfish. All right, we're gonna get to our last section here to talk about resources that are available uh, with, within the Department of Natural Resources and on our web pages. Penji's gonna share some of these links with you folks as well. One of the big ones, it's a scouting tool for your folk. For you folks, it's Lake Finder. Far and away, the most popular part of the Minnesota DNR webpage. Uh, the most fisheries information available to the public from an agency of any state in the nation, kind of the envy of all the other states. We have 60 to 70 years of survey data, stocking records, uh, and we're continuing to add and, and build on it. It's, it's very impressive. You can type in the name of your lake in the county that it's found, and you get a lot of really great components. You get the lake surveys, the access sites, fish stocking, and then even down here you've got uh, uh, lake depth. We actually put the maps out there for you. I'm going to give you an example. Here was the lake that we were looking at, some of those structural elements, uh, the point that we looked at earlier in the neck down, um, a flat over here, 
this is Lake Washington in Lesueur County, which is a great little um, panfish lake. We'll talk about it a little bit, but here you go. If you don't want to spend the money on the Navionics web app, uh, you can go to our webpage and you can download this map for free. So let's break it down a little bit. We're going to talk about Washington. When we when we generate one of these reports, what are we looking for as an angler? What is the information? Because there's a lot of it at your fingertips. First, we want to know how big is it? Well, so Washington's about 1,500 acres. How much littoral area is available? That's a fancy way of saying how much of the water is 15 feet of depth or shallower? As panfish anglers, we want to have a good mix of shallow water areas. That is kind of the nursery area for the whole lake. It's the most productive. There's a lot of life, aquatic insects, and there's a lot of ability to generate things. They warm up quickly in the spring. We need to have littoral area. About half of this lake is littoral area, so that's great to see. Average water clarity, about two and a half feet. It actually has decent water clarity at times, so we know there's probably going to be uh, some aquatic vegetation out here. We know it's a very productive lake from the part of the state that it sits on. And it does have this reputation as being a great panfish lake. So we look at the survey here. This is what I'm saying. You can look at the most current survey, like I've opted to pull up here. And this drop down menu actually allows you to look at past surveys as well. Uh, so you can go backwards in time, see if anything has changed, how fish numbers have ebbed and flowed. In this lake, what's of interest to me is there's always been a component of a quality sunfish and crappie fishery. So we'll get down and start talking about. Uh, what that means with focusing on crappies and bluegills. There are in Washington both black crappie and white crappie, but we'll just focus here on, on black crappie and the bluegills. So as we start to assess this, we've got all the gear types out. There's standard gill nets and standard trap nets. Um, I'll break it down for you just to say the, the trap nets are sampling near shore fishes, typically panfish, sunfish, and, and crappies. The gill nets are offshore and sampling pelagic fish, walleyes, northern pike, pelagic meaning open water dwelling species. So sometimes our crappies suspend and move offshore in the summer. So sometimes our, our gill nets are a better way of assessing crappies. But one thing I guess I'll notice here is we have a catch per unit effort, how many fish we're catching per net. We have a normal range. That's basically looking at all of the fish uh, for that particular lake class and how they stack up, where do we sit in that normal range, and then what's the average weight, and how does that stack up in the realm of uh, norm normality from other similarly surveyed lakes. And I guess I would just call your attention, I know there's no sort of way for you to conceptualize this without looking at lots and lots of these, but we actually have pretty fair catch numbers here. Our catch per unit effort is pretty good on crappies and bluegills, but the biggest thing is the size, right? They're averaging a half pound crappie in the trap nets. They're averaging a third of a pound a bluegill in standard gill nets and trap nets. So just some very nice size available. I'll further move on to looking at a length frequency uh, distribution. These are really handy for anglers to look at. Uh, you can see here, I can look at the total catch for all the crappies in the survey, the total catch for all the bluegills in the survey, and I can break them down into different length bins. A couple of the 12 to 14 inch crappies showed up, uh, fair numbers of 10 to 11. On the bluegill side, we've got a bunch that are over eight inches. Now this happens to be a summer survey where we typically don't catch a lot of the big bluegills. Typically those are sampled uh, in spring assessments. And luckily for this lake, there, if you go back to that drop down menu, you can choose some of the spring assessments and take a look at what was caught out there too. So all this great information at your fingertips, uh, just one way to kind of break down everything and take a look at it for yourself. All right, for our folks that are in the metropolitan area, you have a unique opportunity, the fishing in the neighborhood program. Uh, utilized largely for open water fishing, this is something you can tap into for ice fishing. There's a lot of great ice fishing opportunities, small ponds, adjacent to city and county parks, places, uh, lakes even with public access, places you can get out and fish. So if you're in the, in the metro area, check this out. Fishing in the Neighborhood, our small metro-based program for uh, local fish management. And then another resource I want to turn everyone on to are your local area fisheries offices. Uh, these folks can really help you out with any questions that you have if you want to chase panfish and get a recommendation for where to go, if you want to get information on other species, really anything that falls into the world of fish and fisheries management, 
Um, I'm still surprised that, uh, you know, we may, I, I expected to have a lot more uh, folks that would reach out and ask questions. And surprisingly, um, I don't know, folks uh, these days are, you know, maybe they're talking to the bait shop or going to other places, but a long way of saying that I sometimes wish that we had more folks that would reach out because we're happy to help you. And I know I can speak for the rest of my colleagues. They feel the same way. So we will wrap up here, open up things for uh, questions. I do want to just do a quick plug. Uh, this coming weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday are Take a Kid Ice Fishing Weekend. Uh, any adults that are going out with kids, kids obviously don't need a license until they're 16 or 17. And when they're accompanying their kids this weekend, the adults don't even need a fishing license. So get out, uh, take those kids ice fishing. And uh, you know, if you can't make it this weekend, pick a different time because uh, we love to see folks getting out. This is my daughter uh, playing with Barbies and Bluegills. The classic picture, I love it. Thanks, Scott. As, as usual, you do a, a fantastic job at sharing a whole bunch of information. For those of you out there, like I said at the beginning, I did put those links in the chat section. So if you go to the chat section, scroll up there, you'll see those links that Scott was talking about. And please, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. And we got quite a few in there now. Um, one from Dave. I always I always get this too, and you're talking about jigs and showing all those jigs and a couple. I didn't go to this last year's ice fishing shows, but a couple of years ago I did. And yeah, I, I think you mentioned this before one other time that sometimes those jigs are really good at catching anglers more so than fish, right? And he's he's asking, you know, tungsten's the big the big news, and they are great jigs, but he's wondering they seem to uh, look all the same, the same shape and the same size hooks. Are they available? in different varieties and larger hooks and sizes? So an astute observation by Dave and what he's picking up on is uh, one of those material issues that comes up with tungsten. It has such a high melting point that it's actually soldered around a hook. It's not poured directly on like a lead jig. For that reason, the cost of producing molds is highly expensive. You're seeing all the same sort of varieties, of rounded jigs, similar profiles, segmentation. Everything looks very similar because this is some inside info, they're largely produced at many of the same factories overseas for different, uh, for different companies. Uh, that just is the makeup with, with, again, it being tungsten and the way they have to be soldered and put together. But there are options. There's some that are larger and smaller. I do actually appreciate that they have uh, made the molds for more segmented designs. You heard me talk about the importance of mimicking aquatic insects, particularly with sunfish. And for all these uh, panfish species, they all have, uh, uh, insects as at least some part of their diet. So that segmentation is a good form of mimicry. You're trying to look like something that they would be going out and eating. Great. And Mary had a question too, and I know while well, you're heading up uh, trout fishing for lakes, that opens this Saturday, correct? For in Minnesota, the lake trout opening. That, that's correct. Yeah, just a quick plug there too. Uh, if for lakes that are uh, outside or partially outside of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, uh, they are opening on Saturday. That's correct. So stream trout lakes as well as lake trout lakes. So Mary is wondering about, is there such thing as river fishing for trout in designated trout fishing areas? And I know you're a fly angler and adventure out in the winter, you might head down to the southeast. We got, what is there, eight counties in the southeast that are open for fishing year round? Not necessarily for ice fishing, but the streams are still open down there. Yeah, that that's correct. Uh, exactly. Um, I, you know, it was just a handful of years ago that the catch and release option was available for folks to go down to Southeast Minnesota. Uh, and that, that is open now. Uh, you can go out and do catch and release. Uh, I get the question on ice fishing, but typically those counties and those areas, because they're being fed by groundwater, it's coming up at the same stable temperature. Uh, so unless it's a really large stream, they don't typically freeze unless it's really cold. Uh, so you'd have a hard time finding you know, fishable ice. You'd, you'd have to go down there and, you know, you can, you can fish, you could fly fish, you could, um, you know, you could throw hardware. You'd just have to uh, catch and release only. And, and Jeff had a question on here. He, he frequently fishes central Minnesota lakes and seems like there's a ton of bluegills out there. And I, I think we've all had this problem, you know, you can't keep them off your hook sometimes. And in the winter goes out and has a real hard time finding them. So where do you think they go? Is there any particular spot you would look for? Do they like to go to deep holes and suspend over those? Or I know you touched on that a little bit. But... 
Yeah, it's uh, it can be tough. I will be, I'm going to put it all out there and tell you, I have lakes that I can find fish very easily in the summer. And sometimes where they go in the winter uh, is a mystery. And I've even shared it with some of these lakes with some other very accomplished anglers and asked them to help me crack the code and, and have had problems. So sometimes lakes can be tougher to, to fish in one season or another. But my best piece of advice is kind of what you heard me say earlier, which is just to just to explore, start crossing things off your list, make a list of different habitat types around the lake, microhabitats, um, aquatic vegetation, deep holes, points, structural elements. Start looking around and seeing if you can find those fish in, in one location or another until you've basically exhausted your options. And then at that point, find a buddy and do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You know, we touched on this a little bit uh, during your presentation. I can't remember the name of the rod off the top of my head, but Asha, who I like to call it, does an awesome job getting a bunch of people and kids outside ice fishing in the winter in St. Paul. She's looking for a recommendation on the um, rods you'd recommend for youth and kids, affordable ones they could buy in bulk. Yeah, AHT Enterprises, I'd give them a plug. I mean, I see them for sale from anywhere from 5 to 10 to $15. And like I said, those are what my kids are using. I, I first bought them when I was in college because I was broke. And, you know, they didn't, don't have a ton of backbone. If you catch really large fish, they can pretty much have their way with you. But for bite detection and getting out with kids, you know, if a kid real, this, this has happened to me. Um, this is why my kids are using these inexpensive rods is, I let them use one of my really nice rods. In fact, um, well, I was going to say, it's not the one in the background. Uh, in this background of this picture, there's a, a Jason Mitchell meat stick, another great option, uh, inexpensive. Uh, you kind of see that yellow, chartreuse yellow and orange makes it highly visible. You can see the tip and see if it moves for bite detection. That's the same with these HT blues, um, very inexpensive rods with, with uh, orange on the tip. And they're so inexpensive that if a kid reels a jig with a fish on it or without a fish on it all the way up to the eye and keeps reeling, you know, if you snap your first eyelet or your guide uh, or, you know, puts it in a car door or drops it into the, the tub and breaks it, you're only out five, 10 bucks. Um, so that would definitely be the plug I would give for any youth fishing events. And I'm fairly certain that uh, any of those companies, whether it's HT Enterprises for the uh, Ice Blues or a clam corporation that makes the uh, Jason Mitchell meat sticks, uh, they'd probably be willing to, if it's for an ice fishing program, uh, get you a pretty good deal on a, on a bulk assessment assortment of, uh, of those rods. Yeah, great. Uh, as I do the same thing with my kids. It's give them the old rods or the cheaper ones you can find. And they, you know, my one daughter, Lily, still seems to outfish me every time. So um, Andrew was asking about recommendations for hook size for panfish or crappie, and then also for walleye. If you want to go for walleye, what size hook would you recommend? Oh boy, um, I fish a lot of, this is in the tungsten world. I'm fishing a lot of th as small as three millimeter, five millimeter, six, and I forget if that's a size 10 or 12. I'd have to look at the sizing guide on panfish, but you can go pretty small. I, I also am something of a, a big sucker for big panfish. Um, that's one of the things I like to do in the winter is actually hunt down large panfish and then I have to go a little bit bigger so I'm probably the wrong person just because I'm using bigger gear than I probably should be um, but yeah I would say in that I don't know size 10 size 12 on the panfish and then um, walleyes you can go you can go bigger there I mean a, a size two or or four maybe even six um, you know for walleye hooks you bet another question it, this puzzles me too so Jacob thanks for asking the question if you're Given a given body of water, is there any way to tell, other than talking to the local bait shop or somebody like yourself, if there's a good evening bite or a day bite, um, what's the best time to get out there and how can you tell that on a, any given body of water? Any tips? Oh, that is a good question. I'm trying to think how you make that distinction. I would definitely say that water clarity is going to be a big driver with it. Um, when you have stained water, if you're in South Minnesota, where we have more uh, eutrophic or turbid type of water, it may have a green or brownish tinge to it, including through the winter months. You're probably going to have a decent day bite. It's you know similar to um, Lake of the Woods or Red Lake that are tan and stained. There's a there's pretty darn good bites during the daytime. If you're in clearer water, 
uh, mesotrophic lakes that have a lot of aquatic plant growth where you have really good water clarity, it's probably going to be that, you know, we do talk about the power hour. Um, and there's definitely a pattern to that. You see it with crappies. They're definitely on the chew right around sundown, just like walleyes are. Um, even it's kind of known amongst folks that chase down big bluegills. There's typically that same bite for bluegills right at dark. Perch, I haven't seen it as much. They, they have really poor nighttime eyesight, so they're usually shutting down right before power hour. But other than, uh, you know, that would be the, the only indicator I could try to direct you toward is look at water clarity to maybe be a predictor for that. Otherwise, it's only achievable by trial and error. And that's the fun part, right? <laughs> that's why we like to get out there. So, and Paul had a great question on line. You showed a few pictures on the variety of line that's available out there. And all of it was ice line. Is there a big difference between actually buying ice line and buying just a standard, you know, two or four pound mono filament line is what's the advantage there? Um, some of those lines are, are, are constructed at a molecular level to be a little more resistant to the cold, to be supple in the cold. Um, your summer lines aren't going to do that as much. They might become brittle. There is that small distinction. That being said, I've fished a lot of summer line in the winter. You can do it, um, particularly if you're sitting in a heated shack. It's really probably not of any um, consequence. Uh, but yeah, I guess that was just, I think there, there's definitely been a market. You've seen more line options that are specific for cold water applications. And it's just getting on the fringes of small, tiny, you know, performance variables that might benefit you in a small way. But it's it's probably more marketing than anything. Yeah. It's one thing we'll never run out of is marketing, right? So we have a few questions. And I hope we can get to everybody's. We got a ton of questions coming in. Uh, jig colors. We got several questions on jig colors. Do you have any favorite colors? I know it might do with water clarity or time of day, but favorite colors you'd start with? Yeah, and I think the general rule of thumb is if it's stained water to go to something that's a little more bright. Uh, if it's uh, clearer water to go to something that's more neutral, um, earthy toned. But I am a sucker for, and this is like, we all have our favorites, right? Like, I am just a sucker for like pink and red. I mean, that's usually where I'm starting anywhere that I'm going. And truth be told, when we look at what we're throwing at fish, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever we're, we're dropping down the hole, I think the, the, the whole equation for catching fish to me, I know this isn't what the question is about, but I just unsolicited, you know, throwing this out there is, the location that we're at is the most important, you know, location, location and having fish there and the kind of mood that they're in and putting something that, you know, the, I'd rather have the right profile and size bait um, and color is just such a, it's way down on the very bottom of the list of, of what's most important for, for, for generating a bite in my opinion. Uh, but that being said, I mean, that would be my rule of thumb is water clarity, driving your choices. And if you have something you really like, it's about confidence. Like as dumb as that sounds, it's human psychology. Like I'm more confident in a handful of colors and that's what I throw on and what's tied on. So um, if you've got something you're really confident in, throw it at them. Great. Uh, a couple other questions on one on, on line. We'll touch on that real quick. And what's your favorite pound test line if you're fishing for bluegills? And do you recommend using a bobber for it? All right. So the line question for me is I will go to three. You could get away with one or two, but as I mentioned earlier, I like to tussle with some bigger fish. And if I do that, I can have breakoffs. So three is a pretty good universal panfish uh, test weight that I use. And what was the other uh, question? Oh, bobbers. So yeah. this is, this is a big thing. Like when you're out in the summertime, a lot of times you're setting something under a cork, you're putting a plain hook down with a, a couple of, you know, split shot weights on it, but really not doing that in the winter unless you're setting a set line, you know, with a with a, a minnow down there. Keeping in mind that in wintertime, we can fish two lines in Minnesota. A lot of folks might do that. If you're camping on a spot waiting for a school of crappies to come through or a school of perch to, to, to move over a flat, you can throw that second line down with a, with a minnow and that's a great opportunity to run a bobber. But by and large, for me, when it comes to sunfish, I'm getting my hook and my weight in one fell swoop. Because I talked a little bit earlier about I want to have a bait that is going to give me a good return on my flasher. And I want to have something that I can sink it down there and, and, and put, it, put it on them. So 
Um, I'm very rarely using a bobber unless I'm camping out on a spot. We talked about the importance of moving around, staying on the move, finding fish before you get set up. That's the same idea as there's no sense in me ever putting a bobber on because I know what the depth is from my fish finder and I know if there's fish coming in and I know where my jig is. So it's all contained in that whole system. I think another question I was going to ask you, Donna was asking, this is a little variable for me depending on the weather and stuff too, but and you just mentioned it, the importance of moving around and finding fish before you set up everything. Um, she was looking for recommendations on, you know, I want to go out there and set up my shelter and then start fishing, but it helps to find the fish first. So where do you draw that line of exploring and setting up? For me with the kids, it depends on the weather. Oh, it, it does. Without a doubt, it is weather driven. Um, there's just days that you have to go on a hunch because it's going to be too cold to to hop around. Your stuff freezes, you start breaking things. It doesn't perform well when it's cold. You know, when I when we get these polar vortexes, I'm going to find something that I can just camp on and, and sit. If it's a spot on a lake that I think walleyes or crappies are going to come through. Um, we have an emerging over the course of the last five to 10 years, uh, Lake Sturgeon fishing opportunities on the St. Croix. And that's what I did in the polar vortex last February is just camping and waiting for sturgeon to come to me. And for, for, for Donna's question, yeah, um, you know, if the weather is gonna prohibit you or you got some antsy kids and you can't just go hopping around all over, try to find something. Hopefully you have someone else that uh, has some information about the lake or you have a you have some information from previously fishing in places that you think there's a high likelihood of some fish coming through. And then you just got to go with it. I know everyone's situation is a, little bit, is a little bit different. I'll actually have my kids go run around and play and, and mess around while I start hole hopping, try to find the fish. Uh, and then, you know, once I find some fish, I'll call them over, have them do some fishing and set up the house. Great suggestions. Um, Marine was wondering a little bit more about the inline reels versus the spinner reels. And I was going to add one in there that I've seen a couple guys do here this year. It's the first time I've seen it is they've been using small bait caster reels in their ice fishing rods. I don't know if you have any experience with that or. You, you, you absolutely could use a bait caster. I tend to see a lot of folks do that um, in the winter time with lake trout because you're typically fishing in very deep water. They're in uh, very deep lakes, uh, cold, rocky, deep lakes. And, you know, you may be putting, I'm going to be doing that this weekend. I'll probably be sitting up in 40 to 60 feet of water. And, when I, you know, I do have a couple rods rigged up with bait casters. Again, the line pickup on those is remarkable. It's like a five and a half to one ratio. I can turn the crank and pick up five feet of line. So I can move that bait up and down in the water column. That would be my probably argument is if you're going to fish in really deep water to run a bait caster, but otherwise, you know, I think you heard me say a little bit about the differences in spinning reels and inline reels, whether it's a schoolie reel, a fly line reel, or one of these free fall systems. Uh, it's just trying to avoid line tip twists for, for bluegills. And, you know, I, I arbitrarily set the cap at, I don't want to fish a, a straight line reel in less in more than 20 feet of water. And uh, it's mainly a, a bluegill thing with me. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, one question from Jacob too, keeps hearing about Otter Tail County. This was a fishing opener a couple of years ago, big pan fish up there. Is there any particular reason why, based on DNA research, that there's more bigger pan fish up there? And I know you were part of the pan fish study that went on, so. Yeah, it's Otter Tail County is uniquely situated with having thousands of lakes and it's a, it's a factor probably more so of geology than anything. If we were to take a look at the map of Minnesota, and we laid out a, a gradient of productivity. Obviously that gradient runs at a Southwest to Northeast angle. Uh, our lakes in Southwestern Minnesota are most productive and our lakes in Northeastern Minnesota are least productive, but there also is just a straight West East, um, in, at least in the Northern part of the state, there's a straight West East productivity gradient. If you're sitting in the Arrowhead, it's very unproductive. As you're moving over to Itasca County, you pick up a little bit more. As you head further west to Beltrami or Otter Tail or, um, oh, what else is over that way? I'm trying to think, uh, Hubbard, uh, Cass, Crow Wing, et cetera. You, you know, the closer you get to the Red River Valley, the more your productivity goes up. It just so happens there's a reason that Detroit Lakes is the panfish capital of the world. There's a ton of resources up there. They're middle nourished mesotrophic lakes and they're great for having high productivity, lots of insect life. 
and growing these fish very quickly in many of them. So it really is a, a bluegill paradise out there. Well, maybe everybody will pack up and head up to Ottertail County for the weekend. It's supposed to be a gorgeous <laughs> weekend out. It's take a kid fishing weekend. So bring a kid with you and you can even fish for free if you bring a kid with you. Um, I, I can't think of a an excuse not to get out this weekend. So Scott, I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us on fishing. I know your email's uh, still up there. People can feel free to email you or those links again are in the chat um, to reach out to Scott or any of our area fisheries people. Uh, again, my name is Benji Cohen, Mentor Network Coordinator for the Minnesota DNR. And this is the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. It's one o'clock, so we're going to wrap it up. I hope you join us next week. We're going to stick on the fishing topic with dark house spearing with uh, Amanda Johnson from the Dark House uh, Angling Association. And we're going to follow that up the week after with some hunting, getting on some winter squirrel hunting. So if I didn't get your question, I apologize. I think we got just about everybody, but uh, feel free to send them to us afterwards if you have a burning question you want answers to. So with that, have a good day. Hope to see you out in the ice this, this uh, weekend. So thanks again, Scott. We'll pop into the back room. Great.